welcome to this week's episode. I'm so glad, and I know you are too, to have Dr. Leah Antonevich back again. You know, a few weeks ago we were talking about insulin resistance, and we have fun with that, but we have quite a bit more to say about it. So welcome back, Leah. Thank you so much, Susan. It's always a pleasure. You know, these topics that are so complicated, I think it's fair to say the more we get into it, I'll just say myself, the more I learn about it, the more questions that I have. So this is a really complicated topic. Um, we're not going to talk about every single detail that would bore you to death, but I think what most of our patients want to know are just some basics about insulin resistance and how important it is. So let's just kind of review a little bit what we talked about last time, and then we're going to add to it because you did have quite a few really great questions that we simply didn't have time for last time. So we'll try to address as many of those as we can today. We're being ambitious. Yes. Okay, so first of all, can you remind us in your words, how do you tell a patient what is insulin resistance? What does that mean and what is it? Sure, so if you think of insulin as the key that unlocks the door to the cell and allows glucose to come through, then when we become resistant, that's like that lock being rusty and, and insulin just can't turn that key and the sugar just can't come through where it needs to go. And that can cause a whole lot of problems because some of the other doors can open and then the glucose floods there and it causes them to grow and swell and causes all kinds of problems like inflammation and it's just a vicious cycle. I think that's a really good high level way of looking at it. Um, as we talked about last time and y'all remember insulin's a really important hormone that we make in our pancreas just over here by our stomach and it controls very tightly mm -hmm is the goal. There's sugar in our bloodstream and how we store it so that we have fuel available for future use and we store some as fat so we can survive those long cold winters that we don't have anymore. So this sugar control is critical to our survival but sometimes it goes wonky. Right? It does and um, so you got to remember that insulin is important for energy storage and energy utilization. It also contributes to growth but if our insulin is high we are not utilizing glucose, we are storing fat. So that's what you need to understand. That's the relationship there. Yeah, so most of you who are listening, I think are, I'll just take a guess, are really interested in insulin resistance because of its predisposition to make us gain weight, especially in perimenopause mm -hmm. and menopause. Some people think 40 or 50% of American women have insulin resistance. So this is an incredibly common thing and why is it missed so often? I'll tell you, I missed it a lot as a doctor in uh, regular medicine. We weren't taught to look for it, and we didn't check the right things. Yeah, what you say? that's right. So if I'm fasting or if I fast long enough and I'm just checking a glucose level, then that can appear normal. I also may not be sitting around eating cake all day, and I might have an average calculation, which is a hemoglobin A1C, that looks pretty normal over a three-month period. But what I'm missing in that, and some of the things that we investigate in our practice, are our fasting insulin levels. And we also do calculations called a HOMA IR. And uh, there's some other ratios that we can use when we look at our lipid profile or fat profile. But suffice it to say, you have to dig a little bit deeper and, and look at things differently than just a simple fasting glucose level, because that's not going to tell you what's going on. That's so important, I think. And I will tell you, we both went to medical school, mm -hmm. obviously, and we were taught very little about this. Uh, now, granted, for me, that was 25 years ago, and we didn't know anything about it at that time. So education and just the information that's available mm -hmm. about this process has just skyrocketed and continues to skyrocket. Even to attempt to keep up with it requires you know, several hours a week of staying educated. So we're not judging your doctors if they don't know mm -hmm. about this, and I'm certainly just beginning to learn the details about it myself. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we have to advocate for ourselves. So you mentioned not just checking fasting glucose, but fasting insulin, mm -hmm. and then we'll tell you some other cool labs that you can ask for as well, like your triglyceride to HDL ratio. Exactly. We're gonna write all this down for you in a moment, but there's also some things that you might notice about your appearance that are really cool, and these go back to when I was in med school, we were taught these things. Like, what are some things that can show yeah. up in your body? 
So um, sometimes people can have something called acanthosis nigrans, and so that is where you have a darkening or pigmentation in the neck area, and the texture of the skin can change. It can become like a tissue paper, wrinkly, velvety appearance. Yeah, it's kind of velvety, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. or even a buffalo hump, which is usually more cortisol, but they can be related. Um, people can start developing a lot of skin tags. Um, a lot of times when people have high blood pressure, they're also insulin resistant. And then another measurement that you can do is your waist circumference. If you multiply that times two, and it's more than your height, then you are insulin resistant as well. So that apple shape we often talk about is more likely to be associated with insulin resistance, storing fat around the middle, particularly underneath the abdominal wall, inside your body, around your organs. We call that visceral fat. And that shows up as that, that beer belly that men have, or in women, that apple, apple. shape, right? Mm -hmm. So we obviously want our waist to be significantly smaller than our hips. And these are easy things that you can do at home without even drawing your blood. So uh, coming back to the where I want to just touch on it while we're thinking about it because we have a lot of ideas floating around our heads at the moment. Um, what are some goal levels that you would suggest patients to ask their doctors to look for with say insulin, glucose, triglycerides, HDL, those okay, markers? Okay, sure. So a fasting glucose less than 95 would be super. A hemoglobin A1C, that's the three month average, um, 5 .5, less than 5.5 would be fantastic. A lot of uh, labs will report 5.7 or higher as prediabetes, but that's actually, we don't like that word prediabetes. And really, it's all just a continuum. We right? see, we see um, similar outcomes for people at a hemoglobin A1C of 5.5 as that goes up as people who are uh, pure diabetics. Um, also, the ratio of triglycerides to HDL, we want that to be less than 1.5. The calculation that we do in our office, the HOMA IR, which you can actually plug into a calculator uh, on the internet, it's a fasting insulin and glucose. We like that to be less than 2. Um, even just the liver enzymes really truly should be in the low 20s or less. If they're higher than that, then that's a sign of liver inflammation, which is often consistent with fatty liver as well. That is such an interesting story. So the primary liver enzymes, say we look at something called AST and ALT, and typically the lab will say something less than 30 is normal. But as we've talked about before, the reference ranges that labs mm -hmm. use are basically just looking at a subset of the population and saying, this is what most people have. So kind of like dress sizes being inflated. Yeah, like a, I used to be a size eight and now they call it a two, but it's the same size because <laughs> right. everybody got fatter. Uh, liver enzymes have gone up in the population, and so the average has gone up, but that doesn't mean that you want yours to go up. Right. So that's just an example of how we don't want to look at those lab reference ranges and, and want to be average. We, we do not want to be average. That's a pretty mm -hmm. low bar. It is. And then just triglycerides. You know, our triglycerides and insulin resistant absolutely go hand in they hand. They really do. And so we want our triglycerides to be less than 100 as well. So there's several different ways of uh, kind of yeah. cluing in. And many labs say 150 is, is fine for triglycerides. And now another thing is just look at your history. And you were mentioning this with hemoglobin A1C. Mm -hmm. If it was 5.1 mm -hmm. two years ago, now it's 5.3, now it's 5.4. All of those are in normal range, but it's trending in a direction that's really unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And you could say the same with triglycerides. Maybe they used to be 70 and now they're 90, mm -hmm. now they're 110. And none of those are remarkable, except no. that it's showing something going in an unhealthy direction. So it's a really good idea to keep a spreadsheet or keep a copy of your labs and look at what direction they're going over Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Right? That's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Um, Actually, I, some of the labs are starting to do put that, that on now. it, right? Yeah, some of them nice. do, which is really good. If you've been to the same lab, they mm -hmm. may put the, I think LabCorp does I think this they do. I was say several that. years in a row, which is so helpful. You don't have to do it yourself. Uh, we could not begin to scratch the surface of this today about how this happens, but I think it's important to just generally understand that insulin resistance leads to unhealthy lipid profile. So mm -hmm. as you mentioned, triglycerides go up, HDL goes down, those two are inverse of each other. When one goes up, the other goes mm -hmm. down. And then a whole cascade of other nasty things happen where we make too much of that very low density lipoprotein BLDL from our liver and too much to talk about today but just one of the reasons why insulin resistance is important not just because we get fat which is important 
very important, but also because of all the other diseases that it leads to, right? Not just diabetes. So I was trained that it was just a pre-diabetic mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But we mentioned last time, pretty much everything else too. Yeah, so um, when you become insulin resistant, again, there's that whole cycle of uh, hyperinsulinemia, meaning high insulin and inflammation, and it just goes and goes and goes. Well, that inflammation is everywhere in our bodies mm -hmm. then, and so that affects our vessels. Um, it affects um, insulin being a growth hormone actually as well can uh, contribute to the growth of cancer It can contribute to the thickening of our um, arteries. It can contribute to so many things So all of this this process this out-of-control process basically contributes to well, maybe all of the diseases including dementia There's plot, lots of research about that really really interesting So the good news about that we don't want to be just sound like we're giving bad news is if we can crack the code which you can on how to address insulin resistance your lipid profile will get better uh, not just your waistline will also get better but your risk of heart mm -hmm. disease of lots of cancers of dementia of all the diseases that will kill you perhaps and I may not be overstating to say that the start of all of this mm -hmm. for many people is insulin resistance and very interesting that it often is even in people who have normal blood sugar so we could talk all day about the danger of being diabetic, and that's mm. sort of obvious, right? But you don't have to be diabetic. You may fall into the normal bucket based on what we're talking about with these labs, mm -hmm. right? So super interesting. So that's why we care about it. Um, number one, most of us don't like gaining fat around the middle, but possibly more importantly, it leads us to die from preventable diseases. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's super preventable once we right. figure out what's going on and how to fix right. these things. And it is it is something that you can't address. It's completely fixable, which is fantastic. And I'll just say almost always, even without medication, unless it's become so advanced that our pancreas has just basically given up. So we want to find yeah. it before it gets to that point. So we talked about what it is, how to measure it, what causes it? Like, why do some or even half of American women develop insulin resistance? Uh, going back to our last video, hyperinsulinemia or elevated insulin levels are generally caused by us overeating and not being active enough. So mm -hmm. we don't have to eat necessarily less quantity. We have to change what we're eating, maybe calorie restrict for some people, and then also move our bodies because mm -hmm. guess what? We don't even need that key. We don't even need insulin to unlock the doors, our muscles will just have the cells open up and accept that glucose um, when we're using our muscles like insulin uh, resistance training or going for a walk and things like that. Yeah, I, you know, so many health experts say some version of this, right? And I'm just, it, it, we do sound like a broken record in a way, but I love sort of thinking about dividing health into four pillars, for example, nutrition, mm -hmm. movement, sleep and stress. I'm just sort of talking really high level. And in many experts you talk to, you might talk about whatever health condition in, in that context. Mm -hmm. But I think for insulin resistance, I mean, that couldn't be more spot, spot on. We're talking about nutrition, mm -hmm. movement, sleep, and stress, mm -hmm. and then some other minutia. But let's just, I mean, let's just stick with the low hanging fruit. Like there's so much minutia that we could get into mm -hmm. arguing about, is this better than that? And so on. But there are certain things that are just generally accepted by everybody. Yeah. And we talked about some of those last time. We talked about protein, we talked about fiber, we talked about water. We And I want you to go over that again in mm -hmm. case you missed it. <laughs> and do go back and watch that episode because it'll be helpful. We didn't have time or really get into talking about fat. Mm -hmm. So that's a, something that many of you mentioned that you wanted to hear about, thank you. So can we start with the I'll just say pillar number one, the nutrition aspect again, and, and how do we cure this disease with food? Absolutely. So um, I do want to thank your followers for some, I mean, really brilliant questions, and it was really mm -hmm. cool. I learned from you all, so thank you. But you did, uh, many of you asked about um, fat, and um, we're also going to talk about fructose as well. But um, forget your fear of fat. How about that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we uh, want to make this really, really simple mm -hmm. and we can talk about the good fats and we'll just say overly simplistic that 
all is in olive oil and avocados in avocado oil and most seeds and nuts, whole seeds, whole nuts, not the oils derived therefrom, are fine for you to eat. And you really mm -hmm. don't have to obsess about it and you don't have to measure it. Um, not saying that I'm going around doing the olive oil shots personally because I get plenty of fat and calories from other sources. That's right, you can, but, but probably don't have to. <laughs> but um, that's, that's kind of where we stand on mm -hmm. the whole fat topic. The issue with even using good fats, though, is that they can become um, rancid if they're too old or if they're exposed to light, and that's um, one of the theories about some of the seed oils, but also if you use them to fry. Mm -hmm. So that is when good fats are turned into trans fat. So you do have to worry about frying things because it change the, changes the chemical structure. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, many of you might know and I remember this very well back in the you know 90s and 2000s. Everything was low fat, and I was mm -hmm. really on board with this. Right, I ate the can't believe it's not butter. Mm -hmm. Like there's no tomorrow, because we were taught that was better than butter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was eating all of this um, processed trans fat. And the very long story, very short, is that to make those oils into something solid, you have to manipulate them in a certain mm -hmm. way. That long story short makes them really bad for us. So. As the evidence became more clear that that was really unhealthy, those substances are now actually banned, like the original Crisco. Probably the worst thing you could ever eat is like Rice Krispies made the old way. Can you imagine like <laughs> a bomb of trans fat with sugar? I know, but with some high fructose corn syrup called yeah. Cairo mixed in. Anyway, we did it. I ate them, and my kids did too. But I mean, now now it's actually not allowed. However, if you he did a certain test to measure the amount of trans fats in your blood, and you can do this with tests like Omega Quant. It's still present, even though it's been removed from our food sources mm -hmm. as much as possible, because it spontaneously happens mm -hmm. with, with frying, mm -hmm. right? Not to mention there's a certain level that's still put in certain foods that's just mm -hmm. under the radar. <laughs> so, yeah, so interesting. And, I mean, we could talk for hours about the, you yeah. know, the different schools of thought about what fats are healthy. But, yeah, I totally agree with you. If you stick with the stuff that pretty much everybody in, in their educated world agrees on avocado oil, mm -hmm. olive oil, can't go wrong with those. And then you, there's different schools yeah. of thought about and the I, others. Yeah. I love butter. I do. Yeah. I eat grass-fed butter. I don't eat a ton of it, but, you know, yeah, whatever. Well, I'm going to just <laughs> try to summarize this in like 30 seconds. The whole monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, mm -hmm. saturated fat trans fat question and I don't think anyone could do service to this without talking about it for hours mm -hmm. but I think it's fairly well established that monounsaturated fats like olive oil mm -hmm. seem to be at least in amongst the healthiest mm -hmm. um, people who eat animal products yeah there's some pretty good evidence that animal fats are not as harmful as we used to think yeah. I mean in the 90s we were all completely taught to give up on them altogether it was way too simple, and I was in this group, we were taught, and I believed that animal fats made your cholesterol go up, and that's just what happened. Yeah. Well, sometimes, but certainly you can be a vegan and your cholesterol can go up because of eating seed oils and other things. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, very, very complicated, but just to say, if you stick with the stuff that we pretty much know, you're safe yeah. with olive oil, avocado oil, some animal fats if you're not a vegan. And if you are a vegan, that's fine. You can do very well yeah. with those other oils. And the uh, other seed oils do have some controversy about them being healthy. So apparently my personal opinion is that I'm avoiding them mm -hmm. until we get more information. Yeah. I don't think it's black and white, but I think it's certainly becoming more clear that those are not good for us and there are other choices that taste great. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we'll kind of hang out on that point regarding seed oils and just said, <laughs> so maybe that'll be a longer conversation for another time. But it's super fascinating. Yeah. The, to me, it's fascinating the amount of research that's going on to help us understand these things better. Mm -hmm. And that's just at the very beginning. So uh, stick with what we know. Yeah. So that brings me to another topic about fat. What is the, so we talked about eating protein, eating fiber, blunting our body's insulin response when we eat carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And then fat kind of does the same thing yeah no effect no effect on our glucose or our insulin levels so again 
we're talking about insulin resistance and the hormonal effects that food have, not like total, total calories. So if you mm-hmm. overate fat, that would be a problem too. But you do not have to fear fat from an insulin perspective because yeah. it is completely neutral. Yeah, which is a really good point. Because you can overeat anything mm-hmm. and have too much energy and it will mm-hmm. be stored as fat, even if it's a combination of the healthiest foods in the world. And fats do have more calories than carbohydrates mm-hmm. or protein. And we mentioned we're not talking about calorie counting, and we're not. However, at a point, yeah. we can eat too much of anything. Absolutely. Right? So it is a combination of, yes, we're not counting calories, but at some point we do need to monitor the serving sizes that we're consuming of anything. Sure. Which is why I don't do avocado oil shots, for example, because yeah. it's too many calories for me. Not because it's not good for you. 100%. You right. know, and some of you ask, like, well, I, I want a number. I want a proportion. Right. So um, one good way to do that would say, okay, maybe not 30%, more, more than 30% of your meal being the fat portion yeah. um, is very reasonable. It's just a guideline. Yeah, and we love this number. It's a great number. <laughs> <laughs> 30 seems to come out quite a come up quite a bit. So last time we were talking about some of our fun ways we think of 30s. And so you just added to it. So what what's the rule of 30s and then this other one? So the rule of 30s, you want to have at least 30 grams of protein at a meal. You want to have 30 grams of fiber in a day. You don't want to eat more than 30 grams of carbs at a meal. And you can have your fat percentage be 30% of good fats. That just about covers everything, and if you're using a glucose monitor, Mm -hmm. we don't want your sugar to go up more than 30 points after you eat, so it's it's a fun number. You don't have to follow that exactly, of course, but it's just a good guide, Mm -hmm. I think, and uh, particularly regarding fat, I, I... if you struggle with knowing how much fat you're consuming, I'm in that group too. So my personal opinion is if I'm using some olive oil for cooking and eating some Mm -hmm. seeds and nuts and beans and avocados and get them salmon or getting oil from my foods. I don't personally count it. I just more have a sense that it's in my food. Same. Yeah. And it's another option. Some of you uh, were very correct in mentioning this, that if we're thinking about ways to manage our blood sugar, for example, Mm -hmm. manage spikes on our continuous glucose monitor, you know, thinking about whether we consumed fat with the Mm -hmm. meal, protein and fiber, those are all good yeah suggestions absolutely and that's another way to have your cake and eat it too you know so if you have your protein fiber and fat preceding those simple sugars or even the complex ones you're going to buffer that insulin spike and it's going to be very different and you'll see that on your continuous glucose monitor as well if you don't believe me so this is an exciting point that just you hinted at earlier We've talked about like what we're eating during the day, you know, basically as far as the macronutrients. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to talk about timing as well, which is important. And then what you hinted at there was just the order in which we eat. So Mm -hmm. you can literally eat the same group of food in one order or a different order, and it will have a different effect on your blood sugar. And you'll see this if you're measuring Mm -hmm. it. So Mm -hmm. restaurants typically will serve you bread or crackers or chips Mm -hmm. first right? Or wine or whatever. So you're eating a bunch of carbs first before they bring your meat, fish, chicken, tofu dish, whatever it is. If you just didn't, if if I just didn't do that and just either didn't eat that at all or ate it afterwards, I would see my sugar on my CGM Mm -hmm. respond differently, right? So what's your experience with that? Absolutely. So um, I've actually done that experiment. (laughs) I I actually had um, vegetables and a full meal before having um, ice cream or cookies, and I've run that experiment twice. And at one point when I didn't do that and I did it in the reverse, I got the sugar spike and I went up to 176 or something like that. But Mm -hmm. when I did it in reverse and had the fiber and whatnot, in my system, I only got up to the 140s with the exact mm-hmm. same desserts. So, I mean, it absolutely really interesting. is really interesting. So we can, you can play with this in your own body, and our, uh, our highest goal would be, if you're using a CGM, to have your sugar sort of 80 to 120 mm-hmm. plus or minus something in that range. But when you're, when you're doing this as an experiment on yourself, it is really fascinating because nobody reacts the way you do to mm-hmm. the foods that you eat and the activity that you do. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so so many points here. Um, I want oh, to make going sure. back to what you were saying about the wine in the restaurant. That's oh, the yes. other yeah. thing that sabotages Alcohol. us. Thank you right? for reminding me. Uh, I hate remembering this because I love my <laughs> wine, but yeah, hi, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, so unfortunately, um, alcohol just turns us into fat storing. I mean, mm. it really does. And it is, I mean, do know that it is a poison. It is a disinfectant. Yeah. If you are putting it on your skin to kill bacteria and it stings in your cuts, imagine what it's doing when it's going down inside of your body. So there's that. It literally uh, prevents the absorption of nutrients. It can turn into a it turns into a more toxic substance, which is more like actually fingernail polish remover once it's processed through the liver. Um, it makes us uh, less physically active, less physically motivated. It's a depressant. It causes rebound anxiety. It interferes with our sleep. So not only do yeah. you have to pee in the middle of the night, it literally decreases your deep sleep and your growth hormone, not to mention the expense that you're going to spend. And that might be social expense. It mm -hmm. might be financial expense. or Yeah, and then it's a... It's a fruit sugar, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sugar. Um, it it's so, so many interesting things. I made a video about alcohol, and I, I do drink alcohol, so it was sort of a video to myself about the importance of alcohol reduction, all the things you said, not to mention causes cancer, not just mm -hmm. of the liver that we all think about, but all at least seven cancers in the GI tract and yeah. breast cancer. And in relation to insulin resistance, it, it's basically sugar. Mm -hmm. And then I always say to my patients, uh, even if I drank a very low sugar form of alcohol, like just say you had a vodka on the rocks, it's not the vodka that makes my insulin go up. It's the ice cream I eat afterwards because now I'm <laughs> drunk and making bad food decisions. Exactly. So at least a bad behavior or, exactly. or less than ideal behavior. So something to think about giving up. So yeah, and red wine, of course, and white wine, but highest fructose levels. And we know fructose, which is the fruit form of sugar, again, changes us into fat storing. It's not like we have those gates open in our muscles where fructose can just slide through. It has to be processed through the liver. So um, it's another way of being careful. You know, people think that fruit is healthy, and although fruit has nutrients, you have to eat the fruit, not drink the fruit. Completely different. And that fruit also needs to have peel or fiber. So mm -hmm. cherries and berries, apples and pears, uh, things like that. Yeah. So so interesting. So alcohol. Yeah. If you're if you're on a mission to heal your insulin resistance, it's in the bucket of things that you really want to start thinking about. Uh, waving goodbye to and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we circle back to the mindset part of all this which you know maybe is sort of the most important um, so okay we've talked about the order in which we eat food and then can we talk a little bit about the timing of food there is at least lately quite a bit of controversy about time restricted eating is it good for you is it not and fasting and there's a lot of people on one side or the other of that conversation mm -hmm. Which parts of that would you say are just basically unarguable? I mean, some of it you could get in a debate about forever, but some parts are just basically true. Yeah, so um, if you fast or don't eat, we'll call it time-restricted eating, but if you don't eat for at least 13 hours, so you stop eating at 7 p.m. and you don't consume calories till 8 a.m., you have lowered your insulin levels to a very good, reasonable level. And there are studies that show that that might reduce our um, incidence of cancer and heart disease by 66% if Americans just did that. Mm -hmm. So it's that late eating that does not only problems for your insulin, but reduces your good sleep and all of these things, increases yeah. heartburn. And I could go on and on and on. So I don't think anybody's going to argue with a 13-hour fast, if no. you want to call that a fast. Well, you know? I, I don't think anyone educated could. I uh, will wait wait and see if we get any comments about that. <laughs> and yes, there was, a, there was an article mentioned recently in People magazine that has not been published yet. It was presented as a poster presentation, and we can talk about that in a later yeah. uh, conversation at an academic meeting that suggested that uh, time-restrictive eating of some sort, that we're using 18.6 in this model, was somehow harmful. There was just a bunch of things that are not accurate about that, and it hasn't even been published yet. So and there's frankly no evidence that... that Mm -hmm. Any of those options are harmful. Mm -hmm. Certainly not n not eating dinner late is yeah, what we're suggesting. Exactly. <laughs> like going 13 hours without eating. You can safely do that yeah. while the jury's out on other 
fasting time intervals or and, what have you. And you don't have to do the same thing every day, and I don't know that you right. should. And I think that's the other part. Like, we do want to stay metabolically flexible and flexible in our lives so that it mm -hmm. works. I, I still am a firm believer that you turn into a, just a fat shredder by hour 17. Mm -hmm. But I'm not necessarily going to fast for 17 hours every day. Sometimes I do 13. I may one day a week have a healthy feast. Um, you know, so yeah, it can absolutely. be very flexible. But not eating, I think, for 13 hours or 12 to 13, but 13 is uh, definitely going to be that mark where you get your insulin down. So, and it's free. Yeah, it's really, free. really, and then pretty, pretty <laughs> easy to do. Um, if you're eating at midnight and again at 6 a.m., I mean, that's yeah. something to rethink for sure. And then everyone's body's different, but I think it's safe to say just from working with tens of thousands of women that most women, and I'm in this group, if there was one intervention that I could make regarding the time that I choose to eat, it's not eating many calories late at night. Mm -hmm. Like if I could just shift the same number of calories, this is where it comes back to calories not being the most important thing. I could consume the same foods, mm -hmm. the exact same amount of calories, and just move it earlier uh, so that my biggest meal is my lunch and my yeah. smallest one is dinner. Or if you do skip a meal, skip dinner. Yeah, and track that too on your sleep tracker. Right. I mean, you'll see it. You'll see yeah. the difference in your deep sleep and your sleep overall. Yeah, it's interesting, and I'm no different perhaps than you, that no matter how many times I might hear this from an expert or we're telling you the same thing, for some reason, I think I'm the only human being that might be an exception. So I have to try it out on myself. And I've done so wearing an aura ring, drinking wine. Yeah, it shatters my sleep. I do it 10 times and finally realize that's not going to be a good idea. <laughs> so these tracking tools can be helpful, mm -hmm. I think, in that way that they don't tell you anything you don't already know. But they just reinforce mm -hmm. that, yes, this is actually happening whether it's a CGM or Aura Ring or all of yeah. any of these uh, wearable devices, I, I think it's really... It's proof. <laughs> yeah, it's quite comical how many times I've had to teach myself this lesson that I already know. <laughs> so you may be the same. We're human, mm -hmm. right? So that data can be helpful. But yeah, don't worry about what the media is saying about intermittent fasting being harmful. Everybody's different. And it could be really helpful for you, or at least just not eating dinner late. I think we can yeah. all agree on that. And Absolutely. getting you know, alcohol calories, any nutrition finished two or even three hours before mm -hmm. bedtime, primarily for the sleep. I mean, mm -hmm. coming back to how that's important. So we're talking about nutrition, movement, we'll get to that in a minute, sleep and stress basically. So we're kind of mixing them up here, but anything else you want to say about nutrition? I mean, we really talked a lot about it last time, but this is primarily driven by nutrition. Yeah. You can treat this disease with food. You can. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So food, I think we've got covered. I hope. Let us know if you have any other questions. All right. So hopping back to movement, which we could call exercise or movement or anything that you doesn't make you feel like you don't want to do it. Uh, why is exercise so intimately related with this whole insulin resistance question? Like what happens when we move and use our muscles that makes it better? So we don't need the the key to unlock the door. The doors just go wide open and there's a period of time, there's a window that, I don't know, 30 minutes, 90 minutes, something like that after you have movement and um, the glucose can just go right into the cells where it's supposed to go. And so if the glucose goes out of your bloodstream, then your body doesn't convert it into fat and store it for later. And that's really, really key. Yeah, so uh, there's so many things. This, the, this system in our body is so incredible and complicated, and there are probably north of 20 different enzymes that control this mm -hmm. whole process, so we're not going to talk about all of that. But exercise helps. We store mm -hmm. sugar as glycogen mm -hmm. in our muscle and liver, mm -hmm. and then that's so that we can move our hands around when we haven't eaten for a few hours. So we've got to keep that glucose available, but we don't need to shift it into mm -hmm. storing it as fat. That's right. for long-term use. Uh, so really interesting. And you mentioned uh, some really cool things that you can see if you have a glucose monitor, eat, do jumping jacks, watch and see what mm -hmm. happens. Go walk your dog. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's amazing after a 10 minute walk, it does, it just starts going down. So there's some uh, fascinating, um, some of you might follow Rhonda Patrick, who I think is a fantastic uh, expert in all of these fields. And uh, she has a, a very interesting recommendation. If you're very uh, sedentary at work, for mm -hmm. example, set a timer for every 45 minutes and then 
go to the bathroom or somewhere private or if you have an office where you can shut the door, do something literally for two minutes that elevates your heart rate. High knees, some squats, mm -hmm. jump up and down, uh, run up and down a flight of stairs if you mm -hmm. have one in your office for two minutes out of every 45 and then you can sit down again back at your computer. Mm -hmm. Uh, just those small episodes of exercise. You don't have to exercise for an hour every day. Mm -hmm. Well, you can, but simply two minutes every hour. Absolutely. I mean, it's quite amazing. Absolutely. That all adds up, and you can even do 12 minutes of high-intensity uh, interval training. Um, that is very efficacious in boosting um, your testosterone levels and boosting the amount of sugar that you're going to get into your muscles as well. So there's all kinds of things. I mean, talk about being, um, if you're sedentary at the office, even just being on one of those exercise balls and always mm -hmm. having yourself be engaged or being able to stretch or do whatever it is and taking those breaks. Also taking those breaks, what do you think that does to your stress level? Mm -hmm. It decreases it, and that's really important. We want to keep lowering those stress levels as much as we can during the day. Yeah, so true. So I think it, uh, one way of saying it, and I'm repeating this from another expert, is that, uh, yes, we sometimes say that exercise is the cure, but in another way, being sedentary is the problem. So mm -hmm. if you can just not be sedentary, because uh, some of us are afraid of exercise. I mean, it just sounds awful, or it's like, I don't want to <laughs> exercise. But okay, let's forget that for the moment, and just don't be sedentary. And I actually uh, work at a standing up. I stand up. I don't sit at a desk. And even the act of standing does engage your core mm -hmm. if you are standing in a per appropriate posture. Uh, so just actively stand, or even actively sitting when you're sitting if you're engaging your core. Very small things that... Um, reduce the harm from being sedentary, totally. right? Which in this context, we're talking about insulin resistance, but every other disease in, in mm -hmm. the world as well. So, so movement. Now, if you are, so if you're seeing a patient and they're, let's just say really floridly insulin resistant, like it, not, not the kind that's harder to detect, but mm -hmm. you know, really overweight, high fasting insulin, sugars getting up around 100 or higher, A1Cs bumping up there close to 5.7, triglycerides are high, all the things. What would be, we've talked about a nutrition plan you might recommend for her, mm -hmm. what would be an exercise program that you might suggest? Understanding that everybody's different. Sure, um, I would definitely, if they weren't exercising at all, um, I would start with resistance training, mm -hmm. meaning that I'm going to try to stress the muscles and increase muscle mass, first of all, and start it two times a week and build up to three. Definitely ask them what kind of things that they've done in the past that they've enjoyed, if they have any limitations as far as joints and abilities, and um, just work from there because there's so many different types of resistance training. You can do it completely for free with some bands at home. Mm -hmm. You can do squats, lunges, things like that. You can yeah. do power yoga, which is something I enjoy. Um, I just recently uh, joined Orange Theory after listening to you talk about it all the time. I'm going to so, go after this. And then there's uh, people yeah. that even have trainers. or there's, there's so many options, but I would certainly, certainly start at the resistance training level and building that muscle, and um, that also affects our bone mass as well. Yeah, just count, countless benefits from strength training. And I, you know, my whole life we really were focusing on cardio. Like you've got to mm -hmm. run, you've got to get your heart rate up. And we do want to do that too, so I'm not suggesting that that's not an important component. But if you had to do one thing, it seems like strength training might even be more useful in this mm -hmm. setting. Um, so nutrition, movement, a lot of different facets of both of those. We touched on sleep, and again, a little bit of a broken record, but... As a review, like why is it important to sleep and what are the things we're doing that are preventing us from sleeping in, in the context of this whole uh, carbohydrate metabolism, insulin resistance conversation? Yeah, so again, cutting off the eating and the drinking. I mean, some, some people even will start fluid restricting at 2 or 3 in the afternoon. I don't quite do that, but I do limit my intake after about 6 or 7. Um, but, you know, your sleep hygiene, you need a regimen. So... Treat yourself like you would your child or mm -hmm. a, a, anybody else's small child and have a bedtime routine. That means you're going to wind down and not be on screens and videos a good hour before. You might take a warm bath or enjoy some kind of evening stretching routine with yoga or whatever you need to do to start quieting down the mind and to stop stimulating the eyes so much. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you need to be, it needs to be dark, quiet, and cold. 
Yeah. And that is super important. So um, I want to empower you if you need to sleep in a different bedroom to sleep in a different bedroom for your health. I do. Yeah. If you have a snoring partner, we love them, but um, <laughs> you know, do your social activities together. And then, you know, sometimes you have to sleep in a quiet space where it's yeah. dark and cold. I mean, because that it's critical to sleep no matter what we have to do. Sometimes we have to rethink things. Mm -hmm. And I personally had to, again, going back to the idea of how many times do I have to learn this lesson, knowing what I know and, and telling you all the things that I might know about sleep, I still push the envelope. And that's why I wear a, a sleep Same. monitor to make sh you know help me remember to turn off the TV, to take my warm bath, to put on my sleep mask, to put my phone away. I actually started charging my phone in my office instead of next to my bed. And I don't need an alarm clock. That's a crock of you know what? There's plenty of alarm clocks you can get for $10 from Walgreens. Um, that's an excuse that I had. Um, I also don't have emergencies anymore, so I don't have children that have emergencies. I mean, some of these are uh, what I will just say personally are excuses, but putting my phone somewhere else where I can't, it's not the first thing and the last thing that mm -hmm. I look at. It's mm -hmm. so helpful. It it's is. just a little a little change. Yeah, and not being the first thing. So, you know, you could even say that your good night's sleep starts when you wake up. Yeah, that's And true. how you wake up in that spiritual practice, mm -hmm. um, gratitude or whatever it is. You're not reaching for a phone. You might be reading a devotional, saying some sort of intention, prayer, affirmation, whatever you want to call it, and getting that morning uh, sunlight. You know, there's plenty of research about that as well. And getting that exercise in first thing in the morning because, again, mm -hmm. that's also going to go ahead and decrease those insulin levels it can boost some autophagy and then you have uh, checked off all of the things that you need to do for your health pretty much first thing in the morning and then you can go ahead and have that good uh, protein meal to help rebuild and boost that muscle mass this is so interesting and I'm, I'm just gonna say that I'm constantly fact-checking my own personal bullshit and so um, I am no different regarding the phone thing. So mm -hmm. I had this story that I have to have a phone because I have kids, I need to know what they're doing. No, I don't, they're all adults in college. Uh, I don't need an alarm clock, I, you know, all of those things. If I put my phone somewhere else, let's just say I'm waking up in a peaceful way, doing some morning meditation, gratitude practice, and then I'm going to sit outside to have my cup of coffee to let the low angle sunlight light get into my eyes. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm delaying going to pick up my phone by 20 minutes right in what scenario is delaying that emergency for 20 minutes really going to make a difference I mean that is a huge made-up story you're, mm -hmm. you're gonna get to your phone and your texts and your emails 20 minutes later than you would have otherwise somebody mentioned that on a podcast and I had to swallow my BS I'm like holy yes I'm what scenario would 20 minutes difference make really zero so you can get to these emergencies on your phone later. Mm -hmm. If you're an obstetrician delivering babies and you're on call, that's a different story. But for most of us, it's not really urgent. Yeah. It's, um, it, can, it can wait. And actually, it's an amazing um, feeling of power to make it wait. I don't want my phone to be in charge of me. It's mm -hmm. just restoring some mm -hmm. control over what this piece of equipment can do to your brain, this weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> Right, so really, really good idea. So, so some tips with sleep. And so, you know, some people say, well, I can't get this low angle sunlight. I have to go to work before the sun comes up. And so, so sometimes we do. Mm -hmm. But evening light, too, mm -hmm. if, you, if you've got any way to fit into your life to get some low angle light in your eyes in the morning and at night at times when the UV rays are not damaging mm -hmm. to your skin, it's just good to do it. Not only because it restores your circadian rhythm, but also there's something just about being outside that's, that's helpful for our mental and spiritual health. 100%. You know, talk about bang for your buck. If you can um, be outside with a companion, whether that's a human or an animal, mm -hmm. and exercise, those three things together, doing those every day, completely benefit your whole health. So Yeah, and I, I get that it's not always possible, or maybe it's not possible right now, or maybe it's more possible than you think, that, mm -hmm. that we can create different situations in our life to, to make these things possible. But you're talking about something like leaving your phone, getting up and going for a walk mm -hmm. with your dog or your loved one for 15 minutes 
and then coming home and having your cup of coffee and then getting on your mm -hmm. phone. I mean, is it accurate to say that's impossible before you jump to say that's impossible? Maybe not. I'm just going to throw in that question or in the evening. Um, I have this cute story. My neighbor's right next door. I've lived here for 18 years in this house and then in the same the same lot for longer than that. My neighbors next door uh, every day go for a walk in the evening for about an hour and they have done it every day that I've been here. Um, and I don't think they ever miss one together. And I, it's such a lovely such practice. I mean, I uh, just think that's such a delightful, exciting opportunity to do. Yes. I mean, something so simple to spend quality time with someone in a healthy way. They're exercising, mm -hmm. talking, connecting. Mm -hmm at around the time of sunset every day. And so that's something that I was really um, it's aspired to do. So thank you, neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> These are little things that are not... It makes a huge difference. It makes a huge... And yeah. once you start doing it, and again, this is about mindset and changing, right. changing things, um, you'll come to um, love it and rely on it. And you'll realize, right. well, my day didn't go as well because I jumped on my phone and I didn't, didn't honor myself my and honor what I need to do to be a spiritually healthy person as well. Yeah, it's so true. So these are, you can, there's a million different ways that you could, my neighbors have a way, I have a different way, mm -hmm. you'll have a different way. But, but I think the story that it's impossible is, Possibly not true. Just look into it a little bit more. Is it even 1% possible that that story is not true? Uh, because I get stuck in my own stories. I don't know about you. It's possible. So we've talked about nutrition. We've talked about movement. We've talked a little bit about sleep. Mm -hmm. And then uh, let's get this fourth component of stress, which could include inflammation, could include emotional stress, physical mm -hmm. stress, stress from not sleeping, stress from foods with free radicals, all the things, right? I mean, it could go in a very rabbit holy direction, but mm -hmm. why is stress important in the context of this whole sugar management, insulin resistance conversation? Yeah, well, so when we're stressed acutely, our body's like, okay, we're either going to have to fight or we're going to have to flee, so we need to give you some sugar so you can do those things, and that's perfect and adapted and another just beautiful thing about our bodies. But if we do that chronically or multiple times in the day because we're drinking a bunch of energy drinks mm -hmm. or whatever it is or not sleeping, then that cortisol stays high. And then again, the high glucose and the insulin resistance, and we've already explained how all that um, goes on and happens and can become chronic disease. So it's important that we have those times that we've already talked about breaks during the day, sleeping well, eating foods that aren't inflammatory. So mm -hmm. that's going to be the non-processed foods, not laden with um, pesticides. Might be, for some people, avoiding nightshade plants and things like that. But um, there's some other things that we can do as far as um, eating uh, anti-inflammatory foods or even taking some teas and supplements like ashwagandha or rhodiola. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, many other things as far as um, things not being too acidic or, again, overly processed that will help prevent all of that inflammation and high cortisol staying high. There's tons of things you might read about, um, and I think each of them has some science and then some still unknown of products that can help stabilize blood sugar, mm -hmm. for example. Um, and I think all of these are in the category, in my opinion, that they're not harmful and could be helpful. And it might be years before we've got mm -hmm. enough data to say, yeah, there's like, randomized controlled trials proving that berberine stabilizes sugar but evidence suggests that chromium berberine mm -hmm. we talked about apple cider vinegar some other things cinnamon turmeric right uh, i mean can we say with certainty that there's a study proving that they help not yet but they're also not harmful mm -hmm. and so i think it makes sense to employ things that are probably helpful definitely not harmful and natural good for you in other ways mm -hmm. Can you touch on just a couple of those? Because I know you've done some videos about some of those. And, you know, there is some pretty good science about, say, berberine, mm -hmm. chromium, for example. I'm not so familiar with the apple cider vinegar conversation, but I know a lot of people talk about it. So what are your thoughts on those sure. things? Sure. Um, well, berberine um, is touted as having uh, multiple benefits in the body, but it is uh, nature's metformin, so to speak. So that is actually what they derive metformin from. And so there are studies showing that it does stabilize blood sugar um, and to what degree for every individual is going to vary for you. 
but it also uh, does many other things other than stabilize blood sugar. It also improves our gut microbiome like acromancia. It um, can help with the cholesterol, it can help with high blood pressure, and it's highly anti-inflammatory, and that's probably one of the ways, of mm. course, that it's working. So berberine, as far as the supplement, and I did take it, um, and it did improve my hemoglobin A1C as well. Um, is something that I think is very reasonable to try and it even mm -hmm. comes in a tea if you don't want to take a pill yeah. you can uh, you know or you can grape there's a lot of ways to drive uh, right. berberine and I, I don't think I've ever seen any conversation about any safety issues mm -hmm. with it if it's taken in doses that are no I mean the only thing again like anything please consult your doctor because it is metabolized through the liver and so if you're on red yeast rice or a statin or certain thyroid medications you just want to be careful that that's not going to interfere with this cytochrome p450 but highly unlikely highly mm -hmm. unlikely you know a funny thing i thought of when you said the the thing that we always say please consult your doctor yeah do that but chances are they have no idea yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, uh, I don't know, ask Dr. Leah. So anyway, it's the right thing to say because these are, you know, anything that if anything that has a positive or negative effect in your body is not just affecting one thing. Yeah. Of course. So you want to take it in context of what else is happening. Absolutely. And then um, some of these other things too so, are really yeah, there's, interesting. Um, you know, chromium picolinate, I mean, there, you see one study yes, one study no. It is... Um, you know, probably effective for increased uh, metabolism. I don't think I've seen anything saying that it's harmful. Yeah. Certainly if you were deficient in yeah. it, um, then that would help boost your metabolism as well. Um, apple cider vinegar, um, acetic acid, which is vinegar by virtue of um, that it actually helps break down fats is um, uh, helpful. But it also... Um, interferes with uh, disaccharidases, which are the enzymes that um, can break down carbohydrates, and, and when those aren't broken down and utilized, then you know you're not gonna have those insulin spikes. Plus, apple cider vinegar is fermented, and there's a lot of um, different studies talking about the fermentation. Uh, well, you know that fermented foods are good for our microbiome, but mm -hmm. perhaps there's some good effects on our heart and things like that. So yeah. apple cider vinegar, Harmless. that's easy, right? right? Easy. Make, make a dressing with it. I make my mm -hmm. little turmeric apple apple cider vinegar, black pepper, yeah. you know, tonic that lots of people make. And also, if I'm doing a longer fast, having something with some flavor helps helps me, mm -hmm. I don't know, curb that that hunger. Um, turmeric, I mean, there's, gosh, the, the anti-inflammatory effects of turmeric are um, well studied. As far as the stabilization for blood glucose levels, there's studies on that as well. But I believe, I'm a firm believer in turmeric for uh, its anti-inflammatory properties, and it just tastes delicious. Mm. I love it. Yeah. Um, cinnamon um, also. You have to eat cinnamon in a big quantity, like three grams. So I don't know how many people are going to chug that much cinnamon, but even yeah. putting it on some um, um, otherwise unflavored popcorn is a nice way to get some sweetness and can kind of curb that you know dessert monster yeah. that you want. So I, I think it's fascinating, and we're going to learn more about all these things as time goes on, but my personal idea is if it's not harmful and it could be helpful and you like it, mm -hmm. me try some of these things. And it, it, you'll see in any um, description, or most of the time anyway, if some, for example, an apple cider vinegar product that's being sold for weight loss, it will say that it works best in conjunction with a healthy exercise <laughs> and nutrition plan. Mm -hmm, so none of this replaces it's the true. basics. Uh, but yeah, these are things that you might read about, so we just wanted to yeah. touch on those. Not but, losing 50 pounds on apple cider vinegar no. folks like not yeah happening. so <laughs> right so you can do these things but bottom line is we it's not a replacement for eating the healthy foods in the way mm. that we're talking about and exercise and sleep and stress reduction and i think there's so much to talk about i i just feel like i would be remiss if we didn't talk just for a minute about the gut microbiome mm. because unarguably that's a got a huge amount of uh, things to do with insulin resistance and mm. um, we know that the gut biome, if it's unhealthy, does lead to more rapid weight gain mm -hmm. and more insulin resistance. And so very long story, very short, is we don't want to ignore making sure we keep our gut healthy with simple mm -hmm. things like fermented foods or yogurt if you can do dairy or taking a probiotic if you mm -hmm. are not um, able to eat those types of foods. Mm -hmm. And then fiber. Fiber, which we fiber, about. fiber. Yeah, yeah so, <laughs> so gut inflammation is again, the cause of a whole bunch of other things and very tightly mm -hmm. related to this whole insulin mm -hmm. resistance thing. So, I mean, I feel like we've just sort of skated the surface of about a million things. Um, 
And I think for, for most people's purposes, if you're not you know, in the lab being a, a physiologist studying these chemicals and looking under a microscope, mm -hmm. just understanding the basics is hopefully enough to, to have a general idea of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Particularly for me, it helps me if I understand the process going on in my system to make a good decision. Because if mm -hmm. I'm looking at that sugary treat um, and I understand, okay, I'm going to eat that, my insulin's going to go up, that's going to force me to store fat, and then it's going to make my lipids start looking unhealthy and it's going to be bad for my heart, ultimately could cause mm -hmm. liver disease and cancer. Okay, maybe I don't want to eat it. <laughs> If I didn't understand that process, I would be like, who cares about a little cupcake, right? Yeah. So in that respect, it could be helpful to learn more about how this works, mm -hmm. right? Which leads to the mindset part of all of this, like understanding how it works and, and the, not tricks, I guess, but more tips that we can use yeah. to help our mind to help us to be successful. I love some of the things that you say to our patients in the office. Oh, I have a little thing I say yeah. about peanuts. <laughs> that Leah might uh, be repeating. Okay, you know how some people can't eat peanuts because mm -hmm. they'll eat a peanut and they will get really sick or die? And they might love peanuts. A peanut butter might have been their favorite food, but they are never going to eat a peanut again because mm -hmm. they know it makes them sick. Now, you're not allergic to sugar, and I'm not either, so we're not suggesting it's the same. But in a similar way, eating sugar makes you sick. And so that's really helped me to think about it. and I do talk to patients that way. Like if we think about sugar or wine or not sleeping or all of these things, understanding that behavior is going to make me sick, that can be helpful. I'm looking at it and if I can put a little pause in there just long enough to stop and say, okay, is this a good decision or not? Yeah, that food's gonna make me sick, not unlike someone who can't eat peanuts because they're gonna die. You're gonna die if you keep eating sugar. <laughs> Sorry to be so blunt, but yes, yeah. it's 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 true. So, um, what are, what are some takeaways that you have about? You have some other lovely mnemonics and things that you use regarding stress reduction or ways to approach the mindset part. Oh yeah, well, um, I use the the scanner method. So we already talked about you know having a spiritual connection, a, a spiritual practice, and then C is uh, for connections with meaning. You know, your dog, your friend, whomever. Um, activity, nutrition, and rest. And um, if you kind of run through those five things and scan them every day, then you're ahead of the class and you're going to do very, very well. Yeah, which is really important and simple. So mm -hmm. I, I like to think of this as it, it's simple, but not easy. So mm -hmm. a lot of things are simple, but not easy. Totally. The recipe to cure insulin resistance is quite simple. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, understood. I mean, the physiology is pretty well worked out at this point, even though we're certainly going to learn more. It's not a mystery why this happened or how to fix it or what will happen if you don't. All of those things are pretty clear. All we need to do is do it. And so I guess my question for myself and for you, if you're listening, is what is the barrier to doing that, knowing how well you will feel mm -hmm. when you reach the other side of it. I can tell you as someone who's made a lot of these changes myself, we, we just feel better. I mean, mm -hmm. not just weighing less on the scale, but more energy, better sleep, uh, better gut health, my, my tummy feels better. Um, I just, I feel better all over. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, if you are insulin resistant, then um, stop beating yourself up. You're not, you know, uh, you're a person who's ill or has an illness and you're trying to get better. You're mm -hmm. not a bad person trying to get good. Yeah. So if you look at it through the disease lens and say, well, gosh, if I had any other disease, I'd go get help, then go ahead and enlist some help and have mm -hmm. that conversation with people as well. Like, I'm going to do these things and these things are good for me and I need you to support me, whether that's sleeping in a separate bedroom or tossing through out some things out of the pantry. Yeah. Oh, that's such a good point. I love that. I'm going to just try to repeat what you said. Mm -hmm. You're not a bad person trying to get good. You're a sick person trying to get well, which is so beautiful. There's just so much stigma around being overweight or yeah. having sugar cravings or even a, a sugar addiction or an alcohol addiction or any of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and there are illnesses that we want to heal from. So let's celebrate that mm -hmm. instead of, you know, beating ourselves up and being guilty or shameful about having what 40% of the country has. Exactly. <laughs> right. So we don't want to aspire to be average. I'll leave you with that. We want to aspire to be excellent, be our best selves. 
Well, I hope that we didn't further confuse you and answered a few of your questions. We might have to do part three on this because there's just so much to talk about so in this much. exciting field. And as gynecologists, it's quite interesting to me that naturally because we're interested in women's health that this is the number one thing in women's mm -hmm. health is, is this issue with weight and insulin resistance. It really is. I mean, I'll just say even surpassing hormone depletion. I mean, all very connected, mm -hmm. but super important. Like up here important. So um, I'm just so delighted that you joined us again today Thank with you your so expertise. Um, and you can find Dr. Leah uh, below at completemidlifewellnesscenter.com. That's where we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two offices in Houston, and then we're also able to see you remotely. If you live in Texas, we can practice medicine. If you don't live in Texas, we can still offer nutritional guidance and counseling, uh, not through the lens of practicing medicine because we're only licensed in Texas, but we can still talk and give you nutritional support and advice. And so that's very, very valuable as well. Um, so thank you for joining us. If you like this episode, please don't forget to share it with your friends and subscribe. We love to answer as many questions as we can get to, and I can't wait to see you next week. Mm -hmm.